Hey, I already know this video is going to get a lot of views because it pertains to a lot of people. And this topic actually holds a very special place in my heart. And I think I've mastered being overworked and underpaid at a very young age. And that rhymes, so you know this is about to be a good video. And when you're overworked and underpaid, a lot of things go through your mind. You might feel like you're restricted, like you can't really do anything. You might feel like you need to get out, but don't know how to get out. You might feel like you need to escape, or you might just overall feel like you're defeated. Like what's what's the use in you know progressing? What's the use in doing extra if it just means I'm gonna be in the same exact boat as I'm in right now? You might feel like you're a victim in this situation. You might even feel hopeful that you know as long as I keep doing what I gotta do, I'm gonna get out of this. I'm gonna come out on top. No matter which one you are, this video is especially for you. There's three specific things I want y'all to focus on if you're in the situation where you're being overworked and underpaid. The first thing is I want you to see your situation for what it actually is. That's a part that a lot of people skip and it leads to a lot of decisions that are not wise, like cussing out your boss or storming out and quitting for no apparent reason. And I'm gonna give you some of my examples real quick so I can make this more real to you. So this started back when I was 18 years old or maybe I was 19. Either way, I was a teenager. And I first, I started my first ever job. It was at a Food Lion, which is a little grocery store out in North Carolina. And if you don't know, if you don't know what to think of when you think Food Lion, it kind of reminds you of a Kroger. Anyway, I, I worked their stocking shelves and I did so throughout my college career so I could pay for books. So my parents wouldn't have to pay for any of that because I wanted to be 100% independent. I didn't want to rely on them for anything. So anyway, my time there was horrible. Like it was as bad as I think a part-time job could get. First of all, it was located in the middle of the ghetto, which I didn't mind. I was, hey, I'm, I'm here to work. I'm gonna get my money. I don't really care where it's located. Might have to dodge a few gunshots on the way in, but we'd be all right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It really was in the middle of the hood though. There were drug addicts and gang bangers and everything else you can think of. Anyway, I made a clean 8.75 an hour there, slightly above minimum wage at the time. And it was, it was all manual labor, which again, didn't mind. So the job and the nature of the job, I didn't mind it. I didn't mind the fact that I was on nights. I didn't mind the fact that I had to lift heavy sometimes, had to unload some boxes, had to unload some trucks. It wasn't really a big deal. What was a big deal was how my coworkers treated me. They basically grew up in there and they just felt like they were so much better than me because they could do everything better. They could load the shelves a lot quicker. I'm like, hey, look, y'all been doing this for years. I, this is my first month. Give, give, your boy, <laughs> give your boy a break here, you know what I'm saying? And my boss was just very irritable all the time, very angry all the time, very strange guy. And they treated me like crap. They would always say little things to get under my skin. And you know, when I was younger, even when I was younger, I didn't really let things get to me. But after a while, when you hear the same thing every single day, oh, this college boy over here trying to stock some shelves. He doesn't know what he's doing. He needs to go back and hit the books. One time I was pushing the pallet jack. It was my first time ever using the pallet jack. They were like, hey, it takes a four year degree to learn how to use one of those now. Like they just, you know, little snide comments like that. And one time I even overheard my boss, like from a few hours over, just talking <laughs> mad junk about me. He was like, huh, that, that Reggie guy, he, he's just not a smart guy, man. Like he just, he does not know what he's doing. I don't know how he got into college or what he's doing here. We need to do something with him. Like he was saying this like out loud, like your boy wasn't just a few <laughs> hours over, but they still called me into work extra hours on my days off. They still wanted me to do extra. They still wanted me to come in on demand no matter what day or time it was, despite what I was doing during my summer, because this was during the summer. And what I'm saying is right now, as I'm saying it out loud, like it really doesn't sound like it's a big deal. And in the grand, and in the grand scheme of things, it really wasn't besides the fact that I was a young college kid who didn't want anything to do with that place during the summer. I just wanted to go to the water park, wanted to hang out with my friends or the girl I was dating at the time. Like that's really all I thought about. You don't know how many times I wanted to tell them kick rocks, you don't know how many times I wanted to say a few choice words to my boss and my coworkers. You don't know how many times I wanted to take one of them out back and show them who's boss. But you know, there's power in restraint. I don't care how corny you think that saying is, it is a fact. There is power in restraint. And what I had to do was really assess the situation for what it was like, hey, this isn't so bad. You were doing work for money for a limited amount of time. So you can pay for books for college and then have a little pocket change left over to do whatever you want with. Ain't nothing wrong with this. They might, act, they might act crazy, that doesn't mean you act crazy. You get in there, you do your job, you go home, you keep doing, going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You keep doing that, you keep improving, and then eventually they'll shut up. Next thing I knew, the boys were asking me for a ride home. 
no. I don't like you like that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it wasn't being spiteful. It's, hey, you don't treat someone like crap and then proceed to ask them for a favor like they're going to sit there and do it. I'm not that. I'm a nice person. I'm not that nice. You see what I'm saying? Or another scenario, and this was a really big one, was when I worked my first full-time job. You already probably heard the story, and if you haven't, I'll link the video up here. You know what I'm saying? I have like three different videos going in-depth on it, and I wrote quite a big portion about it in my book that's coming out in August. Long story short, fresh out of college, start off as a manager at one of the biggest companies in the world, manufacturing rubber and tires from scratch. That's what I did. And I led a large team who made said tires. Anyway, upper management there had the tendency to cuss people out. And I happened to be one of those who got caught in the crossfire more than once, I might add. I was way overworked. I'm talking 70, 80 hours a week overworked. I was definitely underpaid. I should have been making six figures back then. You know what I'm saying? I was making like half of six figures then, or slightly more than half. It was like 60 something K. But the overtime put me at like 80 something K. And I was still underpaid. The workers on the floor who reported to me, they didn't like the fact they had to report to a 21 year old kid. So you know what they did? The exact opposite of what I told them to do. So it took me a while to work against that adversity. It took me a while to work against the fact that management didn't respect me. And obviously you don't respect me if you're gonna cuss at me, you know what I'm saying? That's those fighting words. It's okay, I didn't hit nobody, even though I really wanted to. And then machines would go down left and right. And for any of y'all who haven't worked in a production type of setting where it's high volume, high intensity, it's actually really, really stressful if you've never been a part of that before. Especially when you're accountable for every single number and all the quality that's put out and you're accountable for everything the people do on your watch or not on your watch. Like it's, it's pretty scary to think about, especially when you're fresh out of college and you have zero work experience in a manufacturing environment. You get what I'm saying? And that's a lot to handle. So machines are going down left and right. People are taking long breaks. They're leaving their machines for their breaks. They're not taking them one time. The numbers are low, partially, mainly because of breaks. Also because of mechanical downtime. You got managers screaming and yelling and cussing and everything else. Like that's not the environment that's conducive for the growth of a 21 year old. But somehow in that environment, I managed to grow and I managed to succeed. But it wasn't before constantly getting in trouble, constantly being talked to, constantly being yelled at, constantly being called in for overtime constantly being disrespected by the people on the floor. And there were so many nights where I wanted to walk up out of there because I worked night shift. As you can see, there's a theme to the story, night shift. And there were so many nights, you know, I would text my mom at, my mom at like midnight, 3 a.m. All right, I'm walking out, I'm, I'm tired of this place. I can't do this anymore. And every single time she would somehow see it, talk me right out of it, I'd turn right back around. I would be on the brink of literally walking out and quitting because I felt like I was overworked and underpaid, underappreciated, disrespected. And the biggest thing I learned from that, I was only at the, I was only on the job for three months at that time. I was only on the job for three months. Let that sink in. Some people deal with this for three, four, five, 10, 11 years. I dealt with it for three months and I was like, I'm not dealing with this no more. You get what I'm saying? So I had to really look at my situation for what it was. What is the situation? The situation is this. This situation has a young man who just graduated from college, who's making pretty good money, even though I was underpaid, it was still pretty good money to do work, to learn. This is a growing process. It's the worst growing process in the world probably, but nonetheless, it is a growing process. I'm learning the machines, I'm learning the people, I'm learning the personalities, I'm learning the character traits, I'm learning the bosses, I'm learning the leaders, the management. I'm learning what makes them tick, I'm learning what they wanna hear, I'm learning how I need to be. And I'm also making a living, I'm also building my empire from scratch at this point. From this point on, I'm building my empire. So if I'm building something, is it wise to just stop building just because I'm upset one day? Is it wise to just walk away from what I've been building for the, for the past three months? No, it's not. You have to endure that pain, that suffering, that soreness, that blood, that sweat, the anxiety, the mental turmoil. Because you know what? At the end of the day, whose fault was it that I was working there? It was my fault. I could have chosen to work at different, a, a bunch of different places. I chose to work there. And now that I was there, I had to deal with what it was like working there. I had to deal with that environment that I didn't always get myself into. But I could have done better research. 
I have to find a way to put it on myself because that's the only way I'm going to get better. If I just put it all on them and make myself a victim, that gives them all the power. I wanted to give myself the power. You get what I'm saying? So that's what I had to do when I was looking at the situation for what it was. The situation was I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I didn't know how to be stern and assertive with people that I didn't know like that. I was fine doing it with my friends and acquaintances and even family members. I couldn't do it with people I didn't know, with people I didn't know their personality or how to handle. I had to improve. Look at me getting all fired up. I told you this was going to be a good video. I didn't know anything about the process. I had to learn the machine. I didn't know how to report out and sound sure of myself when I was in those management meetings. I got better. I didn't want to deal with that for three months and I wanted to just quit and walk out, but I didn't because if I would have, that would have given me all kinds of trouble. And I think I would have lost respect for myself for walking away from that so early on because I was living on my own. There, there was no option to just move back in with, with my parents. No option. I was too proud for that. There was no option to just go broke and not be able to eat. No option whatsoever. And once I was able to see my situation for what it was, I was able to determine what my worth was. I was able to rebuild myself from the bottom because going through that for a few months, that breaks you down. Nine months in, man, I was, felt nine months felt like nine years. You get what I'm saying? It, it was a long time. And I was working seven days a week, so it definitely felt longer than it really was. 12 hour days, oh yeah. But I was able to know my worth. I was like, nah, like these people over here making me second guess myself. I am assertive. I am good at what I do. I do know how to manage people. I do know how to manage my time. You get what I'm saying? All the stuff that I was doubting, I do know how to make these machines run. I do know how to make numbers. I do know how to do a good job and an effective job and do everything I'm supposed to do by myself. Despite all the bad cards that I was dealt, I was still able to make things happen with what I had. And once I knew my worth, I started to know my value. And then I started getting real popular with that over time. It became basically against my will. Like you will be coming in tonight. Like we need you in the night. Next thing I know, I was working in a different department. Same thing happened over there. And I built myself up. I got tougher, I got smarter, I got stronger. And I built a very strong team. But I was still getting tired of it. I was still tired of working the overtime. I was still tired of being mistreated because I don't care what nobody says. If, if somebody is asking you to come in on overtime every single freaking day without any regard for what kind of life you have outside of work, guilt tripping you to come in, making it seem almost as if your career depends on it, that is mistreating you. And once I knew my worth, I was able to build my resume and I was able to put my resume out to other places. It was a beautiful thing. And from there, once I found the place I wanted to work at, I created my exit plan. It was smooth too. I ain't gonna spoil it in this video now. You gotta go watch the other video for that, but <laughs> I'm gonna spoil some of it. You know how they give two week notices? <laughs> Your boy gave them a one day notice. I had to gut check them. I had to know how they felt about my value there. So I was like, hey, Tomorrow's my last day. T tomorrow's your life. Yes, it is. And, and when I saw the look in their eyes, I saw that weakness. You're not so tough now, are you? Same guy that was just cussing the other day, screaming, hollering, demanding stuff. You ain't doing that now, are you? Because you, know you know what you had. Now you don't have it anymore. It hurts, doesn't it? And I had to realize I had to do what was best for me and get up out of there. Not just because I was mistreated, not just because I was working all of them hours, no. Because I was extremely overworked and extremely underpaid. And that's not a good combination. I knew that if I went to this other place, which I work at now, I knew I'd work half the time and make almost double the money. And that is true. That is 100% true. And I knew what was best for me. And I knew what the future would hold. But before I could do any of that, before I could walk away, before I could say kick rocks, before I could hit them with that one day notice, before I could show them what my true value was and then proceed to walk out with that value, I had to do a few things. I had to look at the situation I was in. Was it really that bad? Yes, it was, but can I hold out a little while longer as I build my credibility, my intelligence, my intellect, my skill set, my strength, my management skills. And then once I do that, can I build the confidence within myself to understand what my true worth is via showing results, creating my own value in and outside of work, having that charisma, having that influence amongst my people and amongst my bosses even. And once I was able to do that, I was able to communicate the same thing, but to bigger, better, 
greater companies that pay way more, that work you way less. You may want to quit. You may feel defeated. You may find yourself in the fetal position. You may find yourself having a hard time to sleep at night. The very idea that your job is controlling you and mistreating you and overworking you and underpaying you, that, that very idea may, may keep you awake at night. For one, you need to figure out how long it is that you've been dealing with this and how long is too long. Because I was dealing with it for three months, it felt like too long, but I knew realistically I had no experience. I had to deal with it at least for a year, at least for a year. Ended up doing it a year and nine months. And that was the time I felt I needed to create my credibility and create my professional brand, so to speak. Because I brand myself as being competent, intelligent, stern, fair, effective, and adaptable. I couldn't say those same things about myself when I was three months in, but I definitely could when I was a year in, a year or nine months in. And so from there, you know, okay, it's like, okay, I've been dealing with this for a while now. I'm only dealing with this for six more months. That is the max I will deal with it. I'm starting my exit plan right now, and I'm gonna start by putting my resume out there for, uh, to other companies. I'm gonna work on my interviewing skills. I'm gonna work on branding myself to other companies as what I actually am and what value I actually have. And when you put that notice in front of them, they, they're gonna know the value they had all along. And you'll see that they see it when you look into their eyes and you say, hey, I'm leaving in a couple weeks. Or if you wanna be a G like me and say, hey, you got a day with me. And that's if you're lucky. That's if you don't make me mad. You can do that too. This is not career advice. This is just what Reggie did. Y'all don't gotta do as I do. But it did feel good to give them one day and watch their eyes get big. They didn't know how to act. I'm gonna tell you now. Watch the video. I'm gonna show you. But yeah, the biggest thing within this is knowing your worth all along. Some of us deal with being overworked and underpaid for years, for decades. You don't have to deal with it for that long. You can up and leave, especially if you have a skill that's hard to get anywhere else. Oh yeah, you can up and leave. Or you can improve yourself outside of that and get yourself a certification or a degree or something that can opt you out of the job you're doing altogether and go into a different industry altogether with better pay, with less hours, with better bosses. Yeah, you can do that. There's nothing stopping you. And a lot of those things are affordable. There's nothing stopping you but you. You know what I'm saying? You might be a little tired, but to me, there's no such thing as being so tired that I can't go for my dreams. There's no such thing as being so tired that I can't escape from the hellacious experience I'm having at work. You get what I'm saying? If you're having an experience that bad that you're staying up at night, that it bothers you so much that you dread coming into work, that you're overworked and underpaid, oh, you, you gotta get up out of there. Or improve your situation, one, you gotta do something. You gotta separate yourself from that madness. And that's how you do it. And, and the heart of it is knowing your worth and understanding what's too soon to quit and when's the perfect time. And that's understanding when it's too soon to quit. Like, okay, maybe I need to slow down some. I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to quit, but it's way too early. I don't, I don't have the financial backing to do so, and I don't have the skills to go anywhere else yet. So let me, let me fall back a little bit. Let me swallow my pride and go through this until I can become a greater version of myself that is then worthy of the higher pay and the less hours. And you're watching this video right now, you are worthy of such a thing. You just gotta keep going a little while longer. But don't let anyone tell you, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do and then let that be the saying for the rest of your life. Because it can very well turn from one year to two years to 40 years in the blink of an eye. It's all about what you're willing to accept and what you're not willing to accept. That is my message to anyone who is overworked and underpaid. Hope you like this video. Anyway, that's a video for today. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Reggie Bryant, and this channel is all about personal finance and personal growth so you can control you, control your finances, and control your life. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Stay cold.